Mark on with us, and I certainly appreciate it. I'm up here in New Jersey, Minnesota, Florida, and uh, it's just a pleasure to have Mike join us for a few minutes. I thought I might catch him in Philadelphia today because the Rangers and Flyers and company made a big presentation, and uh, they're looking forward to that outside game being played in Philadelphia. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to talk with you, Don. I, you guys have plenty to follow here tonight. Not only are the uh, Flyers and Rangers actually playing a game tonight on Versus, it's not one that I'm involved in doing, but you uh, you mentioned all the baseball and out here in uh, Michigan. They're pretty proud of their baseball team out here, and for a strange reason, they're pretty proud of the professional football team, and you wouldn't have said that many times in the last quarter century. Well, you're, you're absolutely right, and the one thing, Doc, uh, uh, the Rangers and Flyers going at it tonight at the Wells Fargo Center. We had a chance to chat about that just for a second before you joined us. And so it was a great opportunity for Ed Snyder and all the folks from the Rangers to get together. And they had a little softball game uh, uh, over <laughs> on the baseball field prior to uh, or following the ceremonies today. So uh, it's been quite an event to move it to the outside. And we've talked a lot about it. And just get some of your uh, thoughts on the outside game. Well, I think it was a tremendous idea at first, and, and the, the real question, I think, in the minds of NBC and the NHL is how do we capture the imagination of people in the United States to draw attention to hockey? Well, there's one day that people tend to watch anything that moves, and that's New Year's Day, and it usually is college football, and I know at the time of our first game, Michigan was playing Florida in one of the bowl games, and that was at a time when Michigan had not collapsed yet as a football program. They're starting back now. And they've certainly had a good start to this season, so maybe that's the road back. But they thought, well, who's the hottest draw in the league? And at that time, it was Sidney Crosby, and if he were healthy, it'd probably still be the case. Well, who has the most chaotic weather and the most unpredictable and, and would draw attention to itself just because it was an outdoor game there? And the answer came out in space, Buffalo, New York. So sure enough, that was the first one, and it was overcast first period, sleet in the second, snow in the third, and <laughs> overtime, and snow still falling when the game ended. So it lived up to that sort of chaotic billing, and then they started to go to real exciting venues that, uh, like Wrigley Field and Fenway Park. So it, it really had a, it was a wonderful idea. It's had a, a terrific run, and this year, because of the NFL being on January 1st, the game has to be played on the second in the afternoon in Philadelphia with the Rangers. Mike Emmerich, our special guest, and uh, Mike, we ought to talk a little bit about the fact that uh, you were the voice of the Devils. Uh, you made that move because now Versus has joined NBC, and they're going to be covering uh, so much of the hockey during the course of the season, as well as the playoffs, so that's got to be a little bit exciting for you as well. Yeah, I think in the regular season, I'm doing 54 games, it's not, and that's not even half of the number of games they're covering, so they're going to be very busy. The first weekend, we have uh, two games in one night. We have Pittsburgh at Vancouver after Philadelphia invades Boston on opening night. The next afternoon, uh, the Rangers and Kings play in Stockholm. And so that game will be carried uh, on versus at 1 o'clock Eastern time. And so it, it's going to be a real interesting start. We're going to have a very busy time right at the beginning. And NBC this year will have a game on uh, Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. That'll be Detroit up in Boston, which should be fun to watch. And then they'll have the Winter Classic, as mentioned, on the second, and their Sunday afternoon game as we get into January. So there's a lot of reason, I think, to be excited about what all NBC and Versus has going, and I'm just flattered that they wanted me to climb aboard with them. Doug, jump in. Yeah, Mike, uh, Doug, it's good to have a chance to, to talk. You've enjoyed your work for for such a long time, and, and we saw last year, I think the ratings were even higher than I think maybe NBC uh, thought they'd be for hockey. I, I think hockey uh, uh, is on an upswing, don't you think, Mike? Yeah. Uh, the day before the seventh game in Vancouver, I know one of our production staff that's really attuned to ratings, which I'm not, said, boy, we'd just love to have a four. We'd think a four would be really good, and it turned out to be five plus. So they were happy with that, and I think you know, when you consider the previous finals, they had Detroit and Philadelphia, or Detroit and Pittsburgh back-to-back -back years, and those were just went through the roof. You think, okay, Chicago, Philadelphia. I don't know if it will be as good as Detroit, Pittsburgh. Well, it was. And then last year it turned out to be one of the second-best ratings they'd ever had in a final. So that, that doesn't necessarily reflect the telecast as much as it does the interest in hockey. 
the fact that the games are competitive and these guys are thoroughbreds that just compete night in, night out, and they leave it out there. Uh, Nick Lidstrom, I know it's an old stat that I've quoted a few times, has probably played 400 games in four years if you count playoffs and, and uh, preseason games and an occasional all-star appearance plus Olympics one year. Mm. Uh, but I don't know. I can't seem to find a bad game that he's played because, you know, when the puck drops, you know what it's like, Don, because you drop them. Uh, when the puck drops, they become real competitive people and they forget about how much they've worked. Well, I'll tell you, we're a little disappointed down in Florida, even though I'm in New Jersey right now. I'll be heading down to, to Sarasota on the 11th of next month. But I'll tell you, that series prior to the finals, uh, you know, involving the Lightning, I, I don't think there was a bad game in the, in the entire match, and it was just a sensational se- seventh game. I still remember Tim Thomas's magnificent save and also his shutout in the seventh game. And, you know, there, there are always questions raised about goaltenders unless they win all 16 in a row. You know, then they don't raise questions about them. They have, have one game in which you let in three. Why, I don't know, maybe the goaltender is getting too tired. How many games did he play in the regular season? Well, Tim Thomas just threw it right back in their faces and showed not only could he play the game well, but he, he responded all of the press attention beautifully. And what a gentleman. So what a gentleman. A real professional. No question about it. Just a, a gentleman throughout the entire, and every time he did a post-game interview, and, and you saw many more than I did, uh, he never, ever took the credit. He always shared. He, he, he gave all the credit in the world to his defenseman and his forechecking, and very, very, never said a thing about what he did. I think the other thing, too, Don, that I noticed was when he was asked a question, sometimes he would pause, which meant that he was actually thinking. He was not going to dial up the, the most uh, uh, credible cliche he could come up with. He actually thought about the question and then came back with his answer. And his answers were not typical. And part of the reason was he took the time to think about what he was going to say next. Now, that, that, sounds, that sounds like what most people would do. But it's really exceptional when you're able, under the spotlight and under the pressure and uh, of all that a goaltender has to do in the playoffs, to come up with that, too. Doug? Mike, uh, speaking about goaltenders, you work uh, for so many years with one of my favorite goalies. I grew up in Long Island and uh, watching the Islanders in their glory years, uh, Glenn Chico Resch. Uh, I know you guys had that great chemistry together. I guess you'll miss that, not being on the Devils broadcast, but uh, it must have been a lot of fun, you two, uh, doing those broadcasts together. It was, yeah. We we had a crew that was together for probably a decade and a half with only a couple of changes. That includes the director, the producer, the tape operator, the guys that make the trips with you. Our traveling group of, of eight people was almost unchanged for a decade and virtually unchanged for a decade and a half. And so, um, you know, I was a cause for some of that change. Uh, the con- my contract was up as well as the one with the NBC and Versus. And rather than doing 120 regular season games, it seemed reasonable to try to get back down to, um, you know, a total of, of, I mean, sorry, 120 total games, including playoffs. I was able to, to cut about 30 games off of that by going with Versus and NBC exclusively. And my schedule wind up being a little saner, but what I'll miss from that, and this will be the first time in my life of 38 years in hockey that I won't be following one team all year, uh, what I'll miss from that is the, is the family notion that you get from being with the same bunch of guys that are the team and the same bunch of the guys that are the crew. During the 21 years that I did the Devil's Broadcast, um, you know, you go through calamities in your life, both my parents passed away. And the kind of support that you get from not only the hockey team, but also the people you travel with, is almost like they're your family and they're with you in, in a difficult time, and there are several of those that I had. Um, that I'll miss, and I'll miss the predictability of all of our shows, because with network shows, they're, they're, they're shows to be proud of, but all of us come in from different directions, rather than from the same direction as you'd have if you were just doing one team. Mike, I was just going to say the one thing you were able to do was differentiate, differentiate between the games you were doing with the Devils. I, I, I thought that you did such an even line broadcast of every single game 
whether it was the Devil's Games or whether it was uh, outside of the Devil Camp itself, as you said, with the close community and the close uh, touch that you have uh, with the players and with the front office and all the rest, uh, sometimes that's very difficult to do. I think it's a little bit easier. Yeah, I appreciate your saying that. I think it's a little easier in a city, in a metropolitan area where there are three teams. If you are in a one-team town, sometimes management wants you to make sure that you favor the home team in your call. And so it worked out pretty easily for me when I joined Madison Square Garden Network because I didn't work for the team. And Lou Lamorello told me, if you're, uh, if you're going to be partial, then you're not of use to us. We, and I thought, what? <laughs> but he realized that the credibility of his announcer was important and even though he wanted you to like his team because he put the team together, he did not want you to be doing handstands when the devil scored. He wanted you to recognize that there had been some real good work done there for that. I think the difference, if there was, between the regional telecast and, and the national one was the amount of time rather than the tone. We always tried to do about because we knew that even though there were other fans of other teams watching, that we were predominantly playing the Devils fans, and so the amount of time we would spend talking about the Devils as opposed to the opposition was about 70-30. With the network show, it was 50-50. But I appreciate what you said about the tone of, uh, of how we handled the games. I, I'm, I'm glad you saw it that way. That was what we wanted to do was to make it one where they felt both teams were treated fairly anyway, even though the raw amount of contact was more New Jersey than the other team. Doc Emmerich is our guest on the show, 714-409-0535. If you'd like to uh, call in and, and ask a question of, of Doc. And uh, i, I got to ask you, uh, Doc, just kind of being a hockey fan all my life, I uh, had a chance to uh, do a little play-by-play on it, but I think the great thing about watching hockey on TV, you can – you can almost do a radio play-by-play uh, on the telecast as opposed to other sports where you have to cut it back a little bit. Uh, is that your approach to it? Because uh, you do almost a radio play-by-play. If you weren't watching the screen, you could tell what was happening just by listening to you. Yeah, to an extent. Um, we don't do near boards, far boards a lot, or right wing circle, left wing circle, because they can see that. However, the one thing that television coverage is limited to is, is that to follow it from the center stripe, uh, we have to be very wide. And so there are times that it's difficult at home, even with the wonderful high definition sets, which do bring the players up closer and uh, do make the pictures clear. Sometimes it's difficult for you sitting at home to identify players. So that is the part of the radio call that I've tried not to abandon, where at least I identify who has taken the puck carrier out, who has it next, and, and where there's time to mention the names of those who have it. But direction and position, we don't do as much. But identification, I think, is just as important on TV as radio. I couldn't agree with you more. One thing that we've done a couple of shows, really from the beginning of uh, the break, uh, during the playoffs, and then over the summer, Scotty Bowman has been kind enough to join us several times. And as you know, uh, when you're in, in Sarasota and uh, in Tampa, that uh, he's almost at every game. He lives, <laughs> he lives right outside of Sarasota and Siesta. But the one thing that he talked about that I haven't seen written or talked about much is that he would like to see two outdoor games, one in Canada and one in the United States. Uh, Sometimes, you know, too much kills things. Your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think too much. uh, A game in each country I don't think is too much. Um, I think if you get beyond that, then not only – do you overdo it? And as Harry Sinden once said when he was asked about whether there should be a five-minute sudden death overtime period, he said a piece of pie tastes good, but a second piece is not always in your best interest. That was his <laughs> argument for not allowing overtime. Eventually it came in, uh, but uh, I, I never forgot that. Sometimes you can have too much, but I think one in each country is fair. It becomes a major event in each country. It does not stretch, um, uh, you know, the ice maker that has to do the outside construction that thin. If we started to let every team in the NHL that wanted to have one have one, there would probably be 20 teams that would want to do it, and we would undoubtedly run into some situations that were not in the safety interest of the players, and for that matter, the best interest of 
fans because, you know, if you don't have good conditions, then you don't have a good experience. I think the first time we suffered through Buffalo, no one complained. Everyone was enjoying it. But, uh, you know, the last year, the, the torrents of rain that we had in Pittsburgh made it rather difficult for the players by the time it was over. And, uh, and so that, that affected the experience, I think, that the fans had, too. Weren't you outside, too, Mike, the broadcaster? I mean, you, you weren't inside, right? You had to be right out there, didn't you, in a, in like a scaffold for oh, the outdoor yeah, games? Yeah, I went out there with, with uh, hooded parkas. And <laughs> the one thing I learned from the first year, I now use plastic on all the notes that I make and yeah. on the scorecards. <laughs> so I'm writing through plastic if I have to enter a goal and an assist. But many of my notes are under plastic because I learned hard way the first year when all the notes ran that... Uh, <laughs> You are out in the elements, and that's one of the that's one of the downsides of it. But yeah, it's part of the fun. I, I think if I were doing football, I'd probably be one of those idiots that would roll up the window just to get the sense of what the fans were going through and the players, rather than being in the nice, toasty warmth. Except maybe at Lambeau Field in December. <laughs> well, Mike, uh, Doc Emmerich, our special guest, and Mike, uh, of course, who did the Devils for so many years. Uh, worked with us with uh, the Philadelphia Flyers for so many years and a great group of people. And, boy, what a run the Philadelphia Flyers had during the time Mike was there before he left to go to the Devils. And then, of course, the Devils had a great run as well. And But I'd just like to relate one story and have you comment on it because, you know, we do have Phil Muchnick join us every once in a while to talk about reviewing sports and, re- and reviewing uh, uh, broadcasters and so on and so forth. And he told me the first Thanksgiving – that uh, you were up there in New Jersey, uh, that you did not have the family there. He invited you over for dinner. That was uh, that, a pretty nice, uh, pretty nice little invitation. Yes, it was. It was very thoughtful. And so Phil and I probably talk one time a year, and it's right around Thanksgiving. And it's basically to commemorate how nice I thought the uh, invitation was. I did have another invitation from people in, in southern New Jersey, so I was able to honor that since I had it first. But uh, you never forget when someone treats you so nicely as Phil and his wife Debbie did. So when I call Phil, it's basically to just catch up on things, say hello, and wish him a happy Thanksgiving. And we do that, I guess we've done that annually almost every year since that time. Well, I'll tell you, we talked about it several times. And uh, as you say, it's uh, it's a very nice thought to think you're over Thanksgiving, your family wasn't there, and even though you had an opportunity in South Jersey to to have two invitations uh, even makes it better. Yeah, it does. It does, and, and you don't forget people that treat you that way, that's for sure. And uh, but, uh, just reflecting for a moment, I don't, don't really like to go back. I like to go forward, but uh, just your experiences uh, at the Spectrum and uh, Father Casey and all the all the things that, that transpired with the Philadelphia Flyers and Ed Snyder and, and uh, Bobby Clark and how he came in and uh, – just a story that's really something to behold. It was quite a place that had a fairly low roof, and uh, virtually any team you talked to that were coming in to play the Flyers of the 70s and 80s would stay at the Hyatt in Cherry Hill, and they would also tell you how quiet the bus got as they went over the Walt Whitman Bridge into Philadelphia because they knew they were uh, getting set for a war. And uh, the early years that I spent in Philadelphia, 80 to 83, was when Clark Barber and Leach were still together. It was fun watching that group play. Some of the tougher guys were then, you know, they had had their time with the Flyers and were going to other teams. Young guys were coming up from the farm team that I'd been at in Maine for three years, from 77 to 80. But uh, they were still, of course, physically, but they sure could shoot your lights out. Bill Barber's still one of the finest left wings I've ever seen play the game. And I think in, in time, you know, 30 years have passed since then, that a lot of the excellence of these guys from the 80s that set a lot of the standards that still haven't been broken uh, get lost. We don't show a lot of tape anymore of Mike Bossy, and half the people that are watching a game on television may not have heard of Mike Bossy or ever seen him play, but he was an automatic magician when it came to scoring goals, 50 in a year. Mm. Uh, we've heard a lot about Gretzky, and every once in a while some of his first scoring times shown. But we all have things differently if we were in charge. I guess one thing I'd do is try to dig out some of that old video just to give people an idea of what the game was once like. 
it's a wonderful game now with Crosby and Ovechkin and people like that in it. But it still was a great game at that time, too. And for the names of people that may not come to recollection of young fans now, that was the reason that it was such a good sport. Well, Mike, it's almost that way with every sport. I mean, you could talk about, uh, and I don't mean to go back uh, too far in, in baseball or basketball or, you know, but uh, there are an awful lot of people that don't know who Will Chamberlain was and don't have any idea who Jackie Robinson was and, and really don't have, uh, uh, you know, Paul Arizon or some of the, the great, great players that played, uh, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, the youngsters, unfortunately, the histories of the game uh, don't come forward too often. Yeah, and I think that's one of the advantages that we now have. Uh, the MLB Network will show complete games from the 50s with all the archaic graphics that once you got a guy's batting average flashed up there at the start of the day, it wasn't changed regardless of what he did. <laughs> right. Because, uh, you know, the graphics were, you know, it took a lot. You had to put individual numbers on a piece of black cardboard and you superimposed it by using a camera over there. Well, you weren't going to do that every time every hitter came up. So it was, it, it's fun to see those games again. Also, as Phil would point out, if he were on with you now, how quickly those games were played because there weren't these interminable uh, periods of time for commercials and, oh. and pitching changes and all of that that went on. But I think with the individual cable networks that we have now for the NHL and for MLB and for the NBA, now we have the vehicle, particularly in the summertime, to see some of those old games that were played. I know there was a Vancouver Islanders playoff game from 1982 that was shown this summer. Well, good. Even though it's almost 30 years old and maybe not a lot paid attention to it, at least some people, oh, yeah, Brian Trotty, I've heard of him. <laughs> well, there he is out there playing so you can see what it was like. Well, the other thing that uh, has hit hockey as well, by the time they came out and cleaned the ice two or three times during a period and called timeouts and go to the commercials, uh, uh, that game has slowed down as well, but uh, at least it doesn't come to a stop. No, that's right. And I think there are a lot of wonderful elements, but the, the number one thing that I think is what we carry with us as we get through, uh, ready to approach this year, and who knows, maybe have a CBA to deal with and more news items next summer, is the fact that you cannot say the players don't give their all when they play this game. I think, by and large, our playing population does a wonderful job of performing and putting on the sport, regardless of the conditions of some of these winter classics and regardless of how many games that they have to play in a short span of time. It's been a lot of fun. Mike, uh, I just want to ask you one more question before we let you go. Uh, uh, your style of uh, play... Uh, I'm Doug. I'm sorry, Doug Miles. I uh, just want to get your st uh, your thoughts. And what, what, any announcers that you kind of, uh, kind of listened to as a kid growing up, and how did you kind of develop your style of play-by-play? -play? I think, uh, you know, I've asked coaches this, and I, I think that all of us are hybrids of who we listen to, and coaches, when they first begin coaching, are hybrids of the guys they played for. They try to take the better elements from everybody. But I think the one guy, and Don may know this guy. I don't know how much time you spent in the minors, Don, but... Uh, but your brother Archie would know this guy, Bob Chase, who broadcast to this day in Fort Wayne, Indiana, does the Comet right. in the CHL. He will be 86 in January. This is his 59th season about to start wow. broadcasting the same team. Uh, he's the guy I grew up listening to. I was a Comet fan, and I still am. And so I was probably influenced more by Bob Chase than anybody. Well, they just put a major feature on the baseball channel, uh, uh, you know, the history of, of Vince Scully and how many years he came yeah. up in 1950 with the Phillies, and here we are in 2012, and he is still broadcasting the Phil I mean, the uh, Dodgers, uh, Los Angeles Dodgers. Came up with the Dodgers, and now he's broadcasting the Los Angeles Dodgers, and has been since the transition. And uh, he learned from the best. He learned from Red Barber. You were talking about the statistics. Red Barber was the first broadcaster that I can remember that had a statistician with him, and he upgraded the batting averages every single time a, a, a batter came to the plate, and that was back mm -hmm. in the late, late 40s, early 50s. Yes. Yeah, well, it gives us all hope when guys work that long, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Does it ever. <laughs> Dr. Rook. Well, Michael, it's been a real pleasure to have a chance to talk to you. Uh, what, what's your travel schedule going to be like? A little bit less uh, frequent fly miles for you, or just as much with the network games? Yeah, the, we work 
working mostly Mondays and Wednesdays. And so the, instead of working four or five, I had one time in March last year, I did eight games in ten days. Mm. Uh, so it will be far less push than that. It'll be a couple of games each week. And so it'll be more time really to prepare better for each game because you, you don't kid anyone. If you're doing eight games in ten days, you can't put in the amount of time that you really should to prepare for each of those games. And so now I'm afforded that luxury by only having two games a week. The playoffs, it'll be four or five a week, and it'll be like the playoffs always are. But the regular season will be a lot more than that. Well, Doc, I want to thank you very much for spending a half hour with us. I know Doug does as well. And, and uh, uh, if there's a compliment to Vince Scully and the Dodger length of broadcasting time, but not only that, the excellence of the broadcast, uh, I'd certainly like to pass that along to you. I, I just think that you've done such a marvelous job for such a long period of time. I wish you nothing but the best, and I look forward to seeing you in Tampa when we get down there uh, to see the Lightning play. Okay, and pay no attention to those centermen that tell you how to do it. You've been doing it all these years, you just keep on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doc. Take care, my man. Take care, guys.